tonight. And we are really delighted to have Sean Murphy. And many of you will know Sean or know of Sean. Sean is a very well-known genealogy teacher and a genealogist from Dublin. And that's one of the advantages of Zoom that you can find somebody or get somebody to speak from anywhere in the world because it's just a matter of getting on the computer. Now, Sean is a history graduate of UCD and he taught adult education classes in, um, in Dublin there from 1989 to 2017. So he has, um, he's a career teacher. He does give genealogy classes via Zoom. I actually took one of those classes there this past uh, winter, highly recommend it. Um, if those classes uh, through the National Library of Ireland, so if those classes um, do become available in the fall of this year into the winter of next year, and you get an opportunity to take part or be able to take one, uh, it very well worthwhile, very, very enjoyable class. And um, it generated a lot of interest. And we had a very interesting group of, um, of classmates, or I did had of classmates. Now, Sean continues to work as a professional researcher, even though he's retired from teaching um, and a consultant, and he publishes historical and genealogical articles. Um, he published one book, Twilight of the Chiefs, back in 2004, and he's working at the moment to complete another book on Dr. Charles Lucas, who has Clare roots from Ballangatty County Clare. Um, Sean also, if you are aware of the Academia website, Sean is a um, contributor to that website, has done some very interesting um, research and articles on um, different families and that they are well worth a look as, um, as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sean. Just two quick things to note. I know most of you are experts now on Zoom because you've stayed with us through the course of our, of our season this year. Um, everybody is muted bar Sean. And we ask that if you have any questions uh, as, uh, through the course of the lecture, that you put them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And when Sean is finished, um, he will answer those questions, but everybody is muted um, so Sean can speak. So Sean, over to you and um, delighted to have you with us and thank you for coming to speak with us tonight. Thank you for that introduction, Jane, and I'm pleased to be able to address members of the Clare Root Society via Zoom. So I think I'll just go over to my slides because I always like to talk to a slideshow. I had the Registry of Deeds. Yeah. King's Inns, Dublin. Now, that's a beautiful building, isn't it? It's designed by Gandon, and uh, it was actually planned by the barristers, the benches of the King's Inns. Uh, it opened in the 1830s. The thing is, I don't think they could uh, maintain the whole of this lovely building. So they had an arrangement with the state, uh, the British government uh, at that time, that the Registry of Deeds would transfer to this uh, right-hand wing here. So I'd say a number of you have been up to this building and uh, those of you who haven't, when COVID is over, because of course it's closed now, uh, put it on your list of things to do. Um, it's almost stuck in time as it were. Um, there are more and more computer aids to researching the Registry of Deeds, but when you go in there, uh, there won't be, uh, there's, there's no uh, tuned in computer screens, you'll be working manually. But as I'll explain later, courtesy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we genealogists know how much they have done to make records available. We know that they uh, do it because it's a spiritual imperative on their part to uh, rebaptize their ancestors, but I assure you um, they leave the religion strictly out of the genealogical material online. So I'll explain to you how to go on to the family search, the Mormon family search site. And this is, if you like, their ups and downs, the down of COVID as well as the suffering and the health problems has been that physical visits to repositories have had to be put on ice. The plus side is that where records are online, we can continue to search them. And courtesy of family search, we actually can continue to search register of these records online. And I'll give you a demo of that later because it's not easy. Indeed, even I, who am a veteran of the registry of deeds, sometimes have to struggle 
uh, through family search. That's why uh, I intended in my last class in the National Library to do an online demo, and it wasn't enough time. So I'll give you, uh, let's go through the door of family search. Here's all the registry of this material and a few tips on how to get into those uh, leases, mortgages, marriage settlements, etc., etc. Now let's just take an overview of the Registry of Deeds. It's one of uh, the state's oldest institutions. It's an inheritance from the British uh, days. The Registry of Deeds was established under the Act of Parliament, 6th of Anne, Chapter 2, uh, back in 1707. Uh, that's the famous Queen Anne, subject of a recent movie. She was the last of the Stuarts, so that's a long time ago. So Registry of Deeds is actually a pre-Georgian institution. Now, as well as having a practical and sound purpose, that is to regularize records of property transactions, it was also specifically intended to ensure the effectiveness of the penal laws against Catholic ownership of land. In those days, political power lay in possession of land. So the penal laws were designed to harry the Catholics and limit as far as possible the ownership of land, even their long leases of lands. So that particular penal purpose has long since disappeared. It probably lingered into the early 19th century, but it has long since disappeared and it's a, a practical um, uh, institution. Now, while it still exists in terms of its records being in the King's Inns building, uh, it actually in real life has been subsumed into the new property registration authority. Formerly, there were two, uh, if you like, repositories for recording property transactions, the Registry of Deeds dated from 1708 and the, prop, uh, the, the, the Land Registry dated from, dating from the 1890s. The Land Registry is a much more efficient system in that it tells you on one folio, like who own, who has acquired property and how it's been passed on. The Registry of Deeds is extremely inefficient. Uh, in that for every transaction, every lease, every mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, you have to have a separate document. And those documents could sometimes be lengthy. Now, we historians never complain about too much documents, do we? But for decades, even back to Victorian times, there was talk of let's rationalize the registry of these. It's very inefficient. Uh, it's finally been done in our time under new legislation in the 2000s. Um, the Registry of Deeds effectively has been subsumed into the Property Registration Authority with the Land Registry. But the new model is the rational folio-based record. And the Registry of Deeds, I think, is in its final uh, days. So as I say, the way to get to the Registry of Deeds, the physical building is, um, if you're coming from town, from O'Connell Street, uh, Parnell Square, go up Henrietta Street, a lovely Georgian street, which is not in very good condition. And then you'll see the King's Inns buildings, which is well maintained. Now, the normal opening hours, because we know it's closed during the, the COVID restrictions, normal opening hours are 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday to Friday. There used to be a small search fee, no search fee apply now. So you can search freely. So hopefully, as I say, uh, we won't be too long now before we're able to get into the registry of these, like the National Library, National Archives, etc. But at present, of course, it's closed. Now, here's an unfortunate strict rule. Uh, we know that in the National Library, National Archives, it's now the custom to allow users to take their own digital photographs. And that greatly speeds up research work, doesn't it? We, we always ask for permission before we photograph at in the National Library, National Archives, but they'll only refuse it if there's a very good reason, fragility or something. No photography whatsoever is for, permitted now in the Registry of Deeds. So the instinct of when it's reopened again, of taking out your mobile phone maybe and taking a few pictures, that is verboten, unfortunately, not allowed. But in any case, could I alert you to a, a very important research tip? Well, it's great to get some copies of, full copies of important deeds, and you now can do that courtesy of um, Family Search. Or if you have a spare 20 euros, you can order a full copy of a memorial of a deed from the Property Registration Authority. But I say that 
your personal abstract of the deed you encounter is your most important research document. Because say you just, uh, say you, 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 you had a lot of money and you spent 200 on copies of memorials of deeds. If you don't abstract them within weeks, months, they'll be lying there in a big pile and you won't have a clue what they're about. So in your own handwriting, you want to say, what kind of deed is this? If it's stated, the date, the parties, what the deed is about. If it's about a small amount of land or a house or two, say in Dublin, copy that. If it's a, a mass of townlands, as is often the case, you would just note the first two townlands. And if you knew the barony and of course you know the county, write that in. Then look at the witnesses, because they often can genealogically be important as well. Keep an eye out for relationships. That's probably the most important thing for us genealogists in registry days are sometimes long, well, frequently long legalistic documents. And if you let yourself know that off, you might miss a crucial piece of information say that, saying that somebody is uh, somebody's father or that somebody has children named such and such. A. But when you come across a really important deed, isn't it nice to have a full copy in your own archive? Say it was a a crucial marriage settlement or something like that. Well, as I say, you have two choices now. You can order a full copy of the memorial at 20 euros from the property registration authority. I find that they're uh, pretty speedy in responding to correspondence during the COVID restrictions. So hopefully that could be obtained. But really, uh, now that they're on family search, I will give you some tips on how to actually go into the family search, find the relevant deed and download it and copy it into your own files. I should stress that when the Registry of Deeds is reopened, work there requires a lot of heavy lifting. I'll, I'll show you a picture of, of what's involved here. So if you have any back or health problems, make sure you have a strong pair of hands with you to climb up the ladders and take down the big volumes. But of course, increasingly, like for example, I. We veterans no longer need to visit the Registry of Deeds as much as we did. Sometimes there are actually research cases where a personal visit, when it's permitted again, actually makes sense. And just to keep yourself up to date with how the, the real records are laid out. But um, most of our, our copies will now come from Family Search. Uh, but remember that heavy lifting, climbing up ladders uh, uh, warning. Now, let's talk about memorials of deeds. The title, which was specified in the Act of Queen Anne, would indicate that what you have are summaries of the deeds. That is now the practice of the Property Registration Authority. They no longer have massive big documents. They have short, to the point, summaries of the transaction. But as I say, we historians are not going to complain at excessive length of deeds, which are more likely to contain crucial genealogical information. And let me tell you further, I noticed from my decades of looking at the Registry of Deeds, in the early years from 1708, it opened on uh, 29th of March, 1708 for business. In the early years, a number of the memorials were indeed summaries. But as the decades went on, I find that by the middle, late 18th century, well into the 19th century, what you're getting are either full copies, word for word, of the deeds called memorials, or shall we say, uh, most of the material in the deeds. I mean, I myself have uh, ordered ones uh, that came in at about 10, 15 pages. Others would be just one or two pages. But um, I, I've heard it said that the memorials are strictly abbreviated versions of the deeds. That is not the case. I would venture to say that most of them are either large abstracts of the deeds or word for word copies of the deeds. Now the first memorial, which is a good one to get to know, and I'll show you an abstract and a, a copy of it in a minute. It was um, a transaction between Nan Fan, yes, it's a very strange name, Earl of Bellamont and Connell Vereker. Um, that's the very first transaction in the first transcript volume, which I'll show you a picture of uh, shortly. Now let's look at some statistics. During the first two decades of the Registry of Deeds, some 35,000 memorials were registered. And by the 1760s, there were over 135,000 memorials. 
the total of memorials exceeded 250,000 by 1790 and had passed half a million by the 1820s. Now, in the Irish context, having an, a repository with so many records is a great boon. It's kind of out of the way up there in Northwest Dublin City, and it's never been blown up and it's never been burned. It's an intact archive. Uh, we should be grateful that an arrangement was not made to transfer the memorials from the Registry of Deeds into the Public Record Office uh, because they would have been destroyed. Uh, so we have them complete. We actually have them in two forms. The original memorials are submitted by the clients and then full copies of the memorials in transcript volumes. Now let's look at the, the, the total number of uh, memorials. Uh, today, the Registry of Deeds holds nearly 5 million memorials. That will not be, of course, 5 million particular names because many people will be, have their names repeated in different memorials. Um, and you'll find the signatures of many of Ireland's historically prominent persons. No, I think I should change that, correct that to most of Ireland's historically prominent persons, because most of those will be, have been property owners and will have done business at the Registry of Deeds. Names which I've seen, Dean Swift, Henry Grattan, Wolf Tone, Daniel O'Connell, Charles Stuart Parnell, William Butler Yeats, Lady Gregory, and Eamon de Valera himself. Now, here is the, if you like, the limitation of the Registry of Deeds for most families, in fact, for most of our ancestors. Up until the late 19th century and the significant expansion of Irish property ownership in the wake of the Land Acts, the registry's records relate to a wealthy elite with a bias towards non-Catholics and with the moderately well-off and poor rarely appearing. So let's remember the Land Acts again from the 1880s until the Windham Act of 1903, the British government itself it oversaw a revolution in Irish land ownership. It, it might be surprising that it, that didn't solve the Irish problem. We wanted more, we wanted independence. But what happened was most of us in, in this meeting will, like myself, will be descended from small tenant farmers. And what happened was that um, they were allowed to buy their farms from the landlords. The landlord had no choice in the matter. He had to sell. But as most of them were too poor to pay the money, the British government came in and loaned the money, which were famously paid back to the annuities. So due to that uh, great revolution into the 20th century, this is when we'll find our ancestors appearing in the Registry of Deeds. But isn't it fair to say that by the early 20th century, we no longer have as pressing a need to look at registers of these records for genealogical purposes. We have the 1901-1911 census, the birth, marriage and death records, church records, etc. So this, uh, I have to stress therefore that the registry of deeds is a repository for wealthier families, landed families, wealthy merchant families, etc, etc. It's a rare case that a small tenant farmer would slip into the registry's records and then that would probably be a, as a, a witness to a deed. Now, the work of digitizing the registry of these records is only just beginning. It's been considered by the Property Registration Authority. But in the meantime, let's remember that Norman Family Search has digitized the records, but not a stress database. You know, what we genealogists and historians need when records are online is a database where, whereby we can search rapidly for particular names. And then that links to an actual digital copy of the records. So we don't yet have that. And when we do, we'll be able to delve into the registry of deeds and find perhaps people lower down the social scale. So if you're interested in landed families, title families, wealthy merchant families, etc., the registry of deeds is the place for you. Uh, again, I always recommend to people when you're looking at a record, even though you have a pretty good idea your ancestors are not going to be there. A check just in case there are always exceptions to the rule. But as I advise my students in my recent uh, class in the National Library, in order to make the registry of deeds worthwhile to you, <coughs> you need to adopt a family. So why not adopt the family of one of the landlords to whom your ancestors paid rent? Um, 
Anybody wants further reading? Now, here's an article of mine on academia.eu, the registry of deeds, the most valuable storehouse of history. I have noted that it's a pro tem summary, and to my shame, I haven't yet upgraded it. Maybe this particular class will give me the incentive to expand it a bit, add in a fuller range of, of notes, and it will appear in exactly the same place when I do it. But for the present, you will get more information on the registry of deeds if you're interested. There, that um, academia.eu is hard to remember. All you have to do is put into the Google search box, Sean Murphy, Registry of Deeds, academia.eu, and I guarantee it'll come up number one. I should explain that academia allows you to read articles if you don't register. And if you want to download them, you have to register, but there are no charges applying. There probably will be a little bit of <laughs> spammy kind of uh, emails advising you of the work of others, which sometimes is very important. I've got things from my feed from academia.eu that were really important and I'm otherwise missed. So if you want to read that article, just Google Sean Murphy, Registry of Deeds, academia.eu and no, take a look maybe in six months, a year's time, because I'm going to expand it. I just toss, this is a list, people rarely speak about the, the people in charge of the registry of deeds, the registrars from 1708 to 1893. And then with the foundation of the land registry, as a result of the land acts, they were term, termed um, registrars of deeds and titles. That's from 1893 to 2006. So they're not really outstanding people, like Honorable Benjamin Perry, Lord Arthur Hill, John Wolfe, Viscount Kilwarden. I think he was the son of the man who was killed during the Emmett Rebellion. You see Morgan O'Connell. That actually is Daniel O'Connell's son. After that, uh, into the 20th century, you see they're usually legal people. And uh, it takes us up to Catherine Tracy, the first Register of Deeds and the last, if I'm not mistaken, because... After that, she became chief executive of the Property Registration Authority. So if you like, the Registry of Deeds was subsumed into the Property Registration Authority. So there's no need for a specific registrar of deeds and titles. I tend to do up little biographies of, of these people. In fact, I did offer to uh, the Registry of Deeds itself a, a paper, if they're interested, on biographies of the registrars of the repository. So I'm working on that. I'll probably add a little bit of that to my academia.eu article. Oh, I should say about these slides, you don't need to be rushing taking notes. What I'm going to do is I'll give Jane a PDF of the text of these slides. If anybody wants it, would you? Uh, uh, Jane can pass them on if you're interested. Now here's a very technical thing which I'm learning about myself. So don't worry if you don't get it first off because I'm still struggling to get it. Collusive discovery. Now, as we say, the Registry of Deeds was formed to stop the dishonest papers, as they would say, holding onto land they were not entitled to. But the canny Catholics found a loophole. Under the penal laws, a Protestant discoverer, as he's called, could file a bill in the Court of Chancery against the Catholic with a legally deficient title. And then the penal here that wasn't hard to find the deficiency in the title of Catholic land and then claim the property for his own benefit. When you think about it, what if you had a trusted Protestant relative, friend or agent who would file a bill and put a deed into the registry of deed, a deed of trust, on paper, he now owned the land, but he left you in peace to enjoy uh, your uh, large farm or estate. It would not apply to little holdings at all. It was for the remnants of the Catholic gentry, who in many cases, like the O'Connors, uh, managed to hold on to quite a bit of land. Or Sir Toby Butler, who has clear collections and is buried, connections and is buried in St. James's graveyard. Um, so this was known as a collusive discovery. I have an idea that the pairs that be were well aware of what was going on. But as another sort of, you might call humane, looking the other way, or pragmatic looking the way, they didn't interfere too much. They were happy enough if the Catholics were politically defeated and quiet. And most sensible Catholics sent that signal to the authorities, to the castle in Dublin, uh, no longer interested in supporting the Stuarts and restoring to the throne and overthrowing the Hanoverians. There was a number who did, 
and they were mostly of the wild geese variety who left the country in the hope, incidentally, that they'd soon be back serving a, a Stuart king, and it never happened. So that's how the collusive discovery worked. Now, identifying these in the registry of these is not easy. I'll give you one example done by the late T.P. O'Neill, who was an, an expert on discovery. He presented the case of one John Myers, who took on paper possession in 1737 of the chapel of St. Nicholas and adjoining holdings in Francis Street. And before the pro-cathedral of St. Mary's uh, became the uh, pro-cathedral for the Catholic Church in Dublin, that position was held by St. Nicholas in, um, in Francis Street. So rather than the seizure, T.P. O'Neill uh, points out, the seizure of what was then Catholic, the Catholic pro-cathedral of Dublin and its precincts would have been an administrative centre, Catholic Church, well known to the authorities, and they didn't constantly persecute the Catholics in the ordinary um, procedures relating to the practice of religion, including the archbishops and their staff. So this was a collusive device to protect the properties from a genuine Protestant discoverer. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, I, I'm expecting to see other scholars do more on that. I will do a little, but let's face it, I've got enough in my place. Uh, I wouldn't see myself doing a major piece of work on that. But I, I hope to write a bit more on it, perhaps in the Registry of these article when I revise this. Now, let's talk about research in the Registry of these, And I'm, I'm going to approach it two ways. Uh, physical research in the registry, which we can do when COVID restrictions are over. But if you don't understand the physical way to research the actual volumes in the Registry of Deeds, you will struggle considerably to search on family search. So even if you, those of you who have never been there, if you just, oh, frankly, swap this up, uh, what, you can get the slide notes when, when uh, Jane sends them on, if you request them, uh, swap this up, and it'll make family search much more uh, searchable to you. So let's pretend we're back in the registry of deeds. Step one, check the grantors index first. And these give the surnames of grantees up to the grantor's name. There is no index to grantees as such. Now, the grantors will be the very large owners and proprietors, and they could grant, say, uh, you will not find little holdings like 5, 10, 15, 20 acres being subject of a lease. But when you're talking about 50, 100, 200 acres lease of a large farm, it's in the interests of both the grantor and the grantee, the recipient of the lease, to have a permanent record of it and to use the registry of deeds to make sure there is a, a copy kept uh, safe in case there's any legal problems or loss of record later. Um, but unfortunately, if you have a name of a grantee, say some of you might have ancestors who had a 100 or 200 acre farm. Alas, you cannot just go in and look up an index to the name of your ancestor. What you've got to do, who was the landlord of that person? And uh, remember, the immediate lesser column in Griffith's valuation usually clues you into that unless there's been a change of landlord. Um, once you know the name of the landlord, check the grantor's indexes. And then if you see the surname, of your family or the family you're interested in, up to check that out. Now, as until the 1830s, they didn't give the address of holdings. There's a lot of work involved. In other words, if it says Murphy, Smith, or Jones or something like that, you won't know if it is your family until you actually take down the heavy volumes and check them out. So it's only in the 1830s. Research comes much easier in the 1830s because the, the uh, grantors indexes give you the full uh, address. Now you're in the position, once you've found an entry or entries in the indexes, these could be relevant, how do I find out? You then uh, take down the large tombstone transcript volumes. Uh, I should tell you that they're called tombstones, not because of having to do with graveyards, because they're as big as tombstones, and they were designed to stop people leaving the registry with them under their coats. So that's a, a reason why they are very well intact. Um, and these two transcript volumes, and you I, I want volume such and such, I want page such and such, and I want memorial number such and such. So you'll take them down and look at them and you'll find a full text of memorials. Now, reading carefully and making an abstract is really crucial to make the best genealogical or indeed historical use of these records. Because as I said before, if you're not off, you might 
pass by the name of a father or a child in, in the text today. They are horrendously legalistic. There's no doubt about that. Now you have a second option. There are lands indexes arranged by county, city, and I should have added there, corporate town. And uh, they're in initial order of townland streets. When you consider the many place names, townlands in Ireland, which start with Bally, you see what a lot of work you're going to have to do there. If you know there's a townland called Bally something in County Cork or County Kerry, there's going to be pages because they're only in initial alphabetical order, not full alphabetical order. I always advise starting with the, the grantors indexes. And you can refine your search or maybe look for something that you haven't been able to find, which you really think should be there by looking at the lands indexes. Now, talking about online help now, even if you are physically working in the registry, be aware of these sites because they can really speed up your work. Firstly, you have the voluntary registry of deeds index project. Just Google again, <laughs> registry of deeds index project and you'll get that URL quickly. This is a work in progress whereby volunteer genealogists, I think Nick Redden is uh, one of the men, the people, people involved. Um, and uh, what they're doing is they are going to as many of the memorials as they can and indexing the names. They've, I think, hundreds of thousands of names, but they've only scratched the surface. When you talk about 5 million memorials, each with an average of, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, 10 uh, names. You can see how vast it is, but they've covered such so much ground that it's always worth your while uh, dipping into that just in case they have indexed your particular uh, deed. Now, this brings us to the family search contribution. Digitized, but I stress not database. In, in time, hopefully within a decade, we'll have a fully database online facility for the registry of these, and we can check every name in every memorial. This, that happy day is not here yet. So what you see on the family search sites are firstly copies of the grantors and lands indexes, which you search online as though you were searching them physically. And it requires more patience and you'll see certain peculiarities. Like in the early days, they gave you sections of letters, I don't know, A to D from 1708 to 1729, something like that. Then they change it and it sometimes can become confusing. Uh, they would give you, I think, 1798 the whole year in one volume. Then there were cases when the handwriting of the clerks deteriorated alarmingly. Uh, usually it's beautiful, easily legible handwriting. So beware of these things when you're searching family search online. Oh, a little tip, which again, uh, slowed me down. I was looking for a Mac name, as we'll see shortly. And it took me a while to remember that the Macs were put at the beginning of the letter M, not under MC as it went down. So remember little things like that. Now I'll show you some copies from Family Search. Isn't that marvelously legible? How did the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints do this? Well, back in the 60s and 70s, their missionaries, as well as trying to convert people, had genealogical duties, because genealogy is, is part of the life core of Mormons, who prefer to be called uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, incidentally. So using the then cutting edge technology of the microfilm camera, they got they all around the world, uh, uh, wherever they were allowed, and sometimes they were stopped. They didn't get into the communist countries until the fall of the wall, uh, the fall of communism. Uh, and they were allowed by the Registry of Deeds, which then is uh, which then is now was under the Department of Justice to go in and do these marvelous microfilms of the indexes, the Registry of Deeds, grantors, lands, and also of most of, not all of the transcript volumes up to the year, up to the 1920s. Isn't that amazing? Now, that was so complex that I think very few of us actually use these microfilm records. We had the original registry. Uh, but once they were digitized, it's a different matter. And once you have high quality microfilm, it digitizes very well. And of course, the moments have state of the art digitization cameras, which can feed in microfilm reels and at 
high speed, turn them into digitized images. So that's what a Grand Tour's index looks like. This is the sparser one before the 1830s. Grand Tour, Earl of Abercorn, and he is so wealthy, he's got probably more, he's got more than a page of entries uh, for the years 1708 to 1729. Uh, then the grantee, Bishop of Cashel, Connolly, Plummer. So it doesn't tell you, it would be easy to trace the Bishop of Cashel at this time, but which Connolly, which Plummer is it? Whereabouts in Ireland? So that's why you have to then note, first number is volume, second one is page, the third one is running memorial number. And they ran them on uh, until I think the 1830s. So it was a very high number then it was approaching if not over the half a million. So you note this carefully and you want volume two, you go to page 13 and you read 2017 or 2018 or 2000 running number 2440. And you're on a quick reading, once you get experience, you'll be able to say, is this relevant to me or is it not? If you have any doubts about it being relevant, make a quick abstract and then you'll be able to go back and reject it. If you say, I'm not the way I'll remember that and go on, you'll forget about it very quickly. So I'm saying an abstract page is crucial whether you're online or offline. So that's the Grand Tours Index sample page. Here's a sample page of the Lands Index. And you see immediately that it's, it's much more difficult to make progress with. Here you have for the county of Antrim, the letter A, and as I say, initial order of townland. There's not a lot of Ards or AAs there. So they've clustered them, they see it's Ard, Aha, Anna, then back to Aha, etc., etc., And of course, it'll go on through the pages. But once you find the town land, or in the case of cities, uh, or, or uh, corporation towns, uh, once, uh, streets, you just check and see. So that's Hill et al., Hill and others to Lord Lessington. Follow me, page 262, number 2732. So you've got your reference, so you can check it out again. So my advice is start with the Grand Tours Index and only come to this when you're double checking or refining your search. Now, this is a photograph of the inside of the registry of deeds. No, I didn't sneak it. I assure you, since the band came in, I haven't taken a single photograph. But at the time I did that, which is about 15 years ago, I was working on an article and I asked for permission to take some photographs to illustrate how the registry of deeds is. And they gave permission. That permission is now rescinded, so I can no longer take more pages. Things haven't changed too much. Here you had the transcript room, and you're looking at volumes which would have been transcribed by clerks, probably poor, poorly paid males. I don't know if any ladies were given that work back in the 19th century. And the handwriting is usually beautiful, and it must have been tedious work, and they wouldn't have been highly paid. So here we are looking at their work. So it, it is like going back into the Keynesian times, even though in recent years, they've done up the interior. When I started back in the 1980s, it was basically like it must have been in the times of Charles Dickens with high Bob Cratchit style chairs, older ladders than that, I assure you, and old tables, high tables to search on. It's much more user friendly, but you can see the problem there. Look at that. If you're not able to zoom up and down the ladder, well, don't, don't zoom. Let's be careful. If you're not able to climb up and down the ladder with this big heavy volume, my practice is I'm right-handed. I go up, I take the heavy volume and put it on my left shoulder and then use my right hand to steady myself and go down the stairs. If you're left-handed, you reverse that. And don't sort of just grab it and run down. It could end in, in tragedy. And uh, look, whenever he opens, our, our genealogical nightmare is that somebody will fall off the ladder and immediately... For legal reasons, they may have to close the facility. So let's all be careful in, in there. So they're very heavy, as you can see, and you can see why they're called tombstones. And the numbers, right from one, where the Nanfan Bellamont deed is, all the way up, and then down corridors around. And then for the later period in the 19th century, they go into other rooms as well. These summary volumes up there are very interesting. I sometimes went up and looked at them. They were abstract volumes, true abstract volumes, which could speed up the search. I noticed they weren't always in order, and I think most of them have gone. They would be worthwhile digitizing in their own right, indeed, before the major digitization, to speed up access. 
are quite good abstracts with full names. Most of them I noticed are gone. If anybody has any knowledge of, of why they were taken, was it for digitization or whatever, I'd be glad to hear. Now, this courtesy of family search again, isn't this amazing? I can get copies of all the various kinds of records of registered deeds from my own archives and also to demo the students. So this is the transcript of the memorial. We're not allowed to look at the transcripts. They're in the basement, I believe. I've never seen where they are. And if you want a full copy and a spare 20 euros, you can indeed buy it. But mostly we'll be happy with the copy of the transcript on the family search site. Look at the beautiful handwriting you see there. It reminds me of the uh, handwriting in the surviving copy will book in the National Archives, of which there are not a lot, because as we know, most of the original wills and most of the copies went up in smoke in 1922 in the public record office. Let's get these all digitized as fast as we can completely, because it's, uh, we don't want another accident like that. So an indenture of lease and release. Incidentally, lease and release is a technical term you'll frequently find. It was a technical means of leasing or sometimes selling a piece of property and avoiding some quasi-feudal um, duties of uh, having the property enrolled and making a public announcement, etc., etc. So don't be too alarmed by that. You'll find other legal terms. My advice is always, if the technical legal term does not have a genealogical issue attached to it, don't be too worried about it. Now, I'll give you an example of that very deed, uh, the Nan Fan El Development uh, deed. This is my uh, way I do it. I, I got it nicely, word process there, but I will just scribble it so that I can read it on a sheet of paper. Oh yes, uh, when the register of deeds open, remember to bring in pencils. We're not allowed to use uh, Bardos or anything like that anymore in repositories. Makes sense. Uh, one slip of a, a bardo leaves a permanent mark. One slip of a pencil leaves a mark which can be removed. So, Registry of Deeds, Volume 1, Page 1, Memorial Number 1. <laughs> the very first one done, so there's no difficulty there. This is a deed of lease and release, 26th and 27th of March, because they did the lease on one day and the release the next day, just for technical reasons. Between one, Right Honourable Nanfon, and of Bellamont, and two, Colonel Verdiger of Ballinascala County Limerick, gentlemen. Grant of townlands of Stevenstown and Ballinascala, 383 acres, that's the kind of holding that would be subject to a registry of these lease, not very small ones and other land. So I just took these two and just noted other land doesn't take too long to copy them all. For the lives of said Connell, his brother Henry and his eldest son Henry, for the rent yearly of 158 pounds and 12 shillings. That's probably sterling, but you want to check if it's uh, Irish as well. Um, immediately know that in some leases, not all leases, well I should say many leases, they made the lease for the lives of members of the family. So that immediately gives us genealogical information on Connell. He tells us he has a brother, Henry, and then another son, Henry. So always read through in case that information is there. Frustratingly, many um, deeds are for the lives of members of the British royal family. That's not really genealogical essential information for us. Let's look at the witnesses. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Nanfan and Daniel Goldborn, Dublin, gentlemen signed by Connell Verdiker in the presence of Daniel Goldborn and John Connell. That incidentally is a reason for paying 20 euros for the full memorial, as opposed to the abstract we get from Family Search. It'll have the signature. If it says it's signed by someone, you'll see the original signature. And that may be something you would really like if you don't have any other copy of a signature of somebody. Now, let's look at doing this by, via Family Search. Some of you are familiar with this. Those of you who aren't, remember, take it slowly and I'm very old fashioned about teaching. Yes, there are things you need to swat up and learn. You can't learn everything by rote, but there's some things you really need to put your hand over the page or over the screen and see if you remember it. So you start with my advice on physically searching in the registry of deeds, currently suspended due to COVID. And now let's take a look at how you search online and family search. Look at the statistics. It's amazing what the uh, Mormons have done all around the world and in Ireland. There was 2,686 microfilm reels 
of the grand tour indexes, land indexes, and transcript volumes of the Irish Registry of Deeds from 1708 up to 1929. That's amazing. Uh, incidentally, the microfilms are with the other Mormon copy records and the original records they might have, relating to their own uh, history in Utah, in the Granite Mountain, which is built to withstand Armageddon and even a nuclear holocaust. But now that they're digitizing them and placing them online, it means that even if the originals are destroyed, we still have copies. That is the main archival strength and utility of digitization. If that happens to originals, we still have uh, copies. So there's the full URL, but remember what I said, if you want to get into this family search site quickly, just Google, Registry of Deeds, Family Search, and put in that number, 185720. Put that in the search. And you see, the Mormons have so much online through Family Search that if you don't put in the right Google words, you'll probably end up on another part of their site or on their catalog, and you won't get through to this important site for Ireland. Uh, now, there's no charge for using Family Search, as I said, but you must register. And they won't let you in unless you put in or update if you haven't used it for a while they require you to put in your email uh, for your username and then choose a password and remember you get no spam i'm now working uh, with mormon materials for decades they've even stopped knocking at my door to try and convert me i was too much of a genealogy ball right asking what was happening in utah but in any case there's no spam they have a strict division between their religious functions and their genealogical ones. Now, there is no database as yet of names in this collection, so the contemporary indexes have to be used. Even the Mormons with all their resources, and all members of the Mormon church have to pay literal tithes, a goodly, a substantial proportion of which goes to genealogical work. But I, I doubt very much if having given us the gift of the 2,686 microfilm reels online, that they'll also come back with a database as they have done with other classes of uh, records. So we have got to use the old uh, registry of deeds finding aids, the grantors indexes, noting that there's no index to grantees, and the land indexes. Then you can access the volumes of memorial transcripts. As I note, there's sometimes some reads, but they're usually full of substantial copies of deeds. Again, my advice, the Family Search Registry of Deeds online material is marvelous, but is not easy to navigate without having research in the Registry of Deeds or at least understanding its system. And I've given you some advice on that. Now, I decided to give you an example of deed. Um, Charles Lucas, uh, who, who was born in Balangadi, we believe, and later went to Dublin and became a pretty outstanding uh, patriot. Not a lot of people have heard of him. I've written a, a compact biography, which is on academia.eu. Those of you who are interested in that, they still look just living in the vicinity of, of Ennis Time. Incidentally, I, I, I spoke to someone when I gave a talk on, on Charles Lucas uh, back in 2013. But those of you who are interested in Charles Lucas, you will get a compact, but the best, in my opinion, biography of Charles Lucas with it short but interesting account of the pedigree of the Lucases. Incidentally, they were Cromwellians. Uh, and uh, Charles then, if you like, developed patriotism. He was a strong Protestant, but he deserves a, a position of honor in our pantheon of uh, nationalist uh, heroes. Uh, so if you want that. Now I looked at my deeds for the Lukes and I didn't think they were as good as the one I found. We holiday uh, around Doolin and sometimes call into the Amos, the um, uh, hotel in Ennis Diamond, the Falls Hotel, for a coffee or, or a small meal, and that's close as well. We're looking forward to going back to it uh, as soon as possible. So I decided uh, the McNamara's, as, as you will know, former owners of Ennis Diamond House, so I said, I look for a marriage settlement of one of the McNamara's. And I noticed that uh, a McNamara married in 1798. So I said, I'll go looking for that. Um, William Nugent McNamara married Susanna Finucane. Now, despite their Gaelic names, I assure you they're very much gentry, and the McNamara's had converted from Catholicism to Protestantism sometime, I think, in the 18th century. I should have stressed that before when I was talking about the penal laws. The most safe and sure method of stopping discoverers taking your land was to abandon your Catholic religion and become Protestant, which not a lot of people 
did, and some only pretended to do it. But the McNamara's were Protestants by the late 18th century, but they were supporters of O'Connell in the 19th century and supporters of repeal. So you think our history is complicated, isn't it? Um, so now that I, I have the marriage, I don't know for certain there is a, a marriage settlement, but in the case of families of this rank and wealth, legal prudence would require that the marriage settlement. So now you forget one of the proof purpose of the marriage settlement, two, two of the purpose of the marriage settlement was to preserve the integrity of the uh, groom's estate and also to provide, to protect the uh, dowry, the contribution of the female. So uh, believe it or not, there were certain protections for the rights of women in those days. It wasn't until the Succession Act in the 1960s that women, for example, had protection from being left out of their husband's will. Oh, indeed, husbands uh, protected from being left out of their wives' wills. So the marriage settlement was a crucial document. And it's this two families coming together in marriage, genealogically, it's usually contained lots of information. So I went to the indexes on family search, uh, the grantors index, to the letter M, and the max are at the beginning of the section for letter M, and in the year 1798, there wasn't any problems. Usually the marriage settlement is in the year of the marriage, sometimes before, more usually after. So I found the deed in the index, the grantors index, with the relevant names, especially William Mears and uh, McNamara. And uh, it's volume 515, page 491, memorial number 335702. I then scroll down further, and this took time, even for me, even experience, that's a warning to you, finding the correct page of the correct volume with the full transfer of the deed takes time. That's why I'm not going to attempt to demo it uh, here. Um, I found the number memorial, I scanned it to make sure it was right. I mean, I wouldn't assume it could have been another kind of deed. Sometimes they tell you in the index, marriage articles. In this case, they hadn't written marriage articles, but it turned out to be the marriage settlement I was looking for. So I downloaded and uh, saved it uh, as a file. I actually transcribed the, the, the full, full page is too large to fit on an A4 sheet of paper. So my practice is I turn the A4 into a um, landscape and I cut the page in two um, uh, using Photoshop elements. And then I have, say for a, a, four, a two page a deed, I have four pages. It's no good if you're trying for one whole page on an A4 sheet, you just can't read it. However, if you save them as JPEGs or PDFs, then you can zoom in and get them. But I think you really need a coherent uh, version of this deed to have. In fact, here we are. This is the McNamara Mary Seth we're talking about as I made a hard copy of them. You don't want to make a hard copy version, isn't that right? But this was so important to me, I wanted a, copy, a hard copy in my file, which was legible. So I broke it up into three sections, because it was a page and a half. And uh, I have it in my files. So if you get the knack of that, you're really making full use of the registry uh, of these. Because some, frequently in genealogical research, you want to go back to a document, not once or twice, three times or more, months, sometimes years after it, to read it, to, to try and understand something better. So I must suggest and do that every time, but once you really have a, so say, a home dinner of a deed like this, like the Maryland Irish Settlement, you uh, might want to make your own copy. If you spare 20 euros, you can get a copy, which will not be of this, but of the separate original memorial with signatures uh, from the property registration. Now, just some notes about what I found there. The groom's father was named in the deed as Francis McNamara, Esquire of Doolan County Clare. So I confirmed they had the right family, and the newest father was Francis. And the bride's father as the, the Honourable Matthias Venuken, a justice of the Court of Common Pleas. Another Gaelic name, but this family too had clearly. Uh, converted to Protestantism because it wasn't until the penal laws were relaxed in the 19th century, uh, in the earlier decks of the 19th century after emancipation, in effect, that Catholics could become judges. Now, Ennestine House was not the residence of the McNamara's in 1798. It was Doolan, a uh, house in Doolan, which was destroyed by the IRA during the War of Independence. I don't know where it is in Doolan. Next time I go down there, I must ask. 
uh, locals who have knowledge where on earth the duel in the house was. They, they say there's not a trace of it left. But in 1843, Raji, as a result of his marriage to Susanna Finucane, William Nugent McNamara, who was an MP and quite a prominent figure, uh, inherited or received ownership of Ennis Diamond House. It remained the family home for the McNamaras in the 1940s. The last of the McNamaras tried to turn it into a hotel. He wasn't very business-like, he failed. His daughter was Kathleen, isn't that right, who married uh, Dylan Thomas. And it's now the Falls Hotel in this time. As, as I say in all class, sometimes it's good to step back as genealogists and take a look at the background history, because it is, a, shall we say, a, a advice of some of us genealogists that we only have births, marriages and deaths, which can become tedious. A bit of local history as well as family history. So that's my um, personal copy, downloaded in pieces, if you like, from Family Search and turn into um, a hard copy as well. So you can just about make that out of here. To the register of, to the register appointed by Act of Parliament for registering deeds, leases, so on and so forth, and then the deed made in a certain date, 1798, between William Nugent and McNamara. Oh, sorry, starts off with Francis McNamara and his son, William, and then goes on to um, the Honourable Matthias Van Eucken and his daughter Susanna. So you see how the marriage set, and set out. It doesn't lead with the groom and bride, it leads with the father of the fathers of the groom and bride, and then goes on to name trustees, one of whom is O'Brien. There's clear connections between the McNamara's, of course, and the Van Eucken's and the O'Brien. So one of the um, trustees is O'Brien. So that's technically why they index that McNamara to O'Brien. I find the uh, marriage settlements in particular uh, generously indexed in the um, grantors indexes. So that's that. Oops. So I think I'll end that now. Stop share and come back. So pass back to Jane. We should, be, we should be back. The, my, my slides have gone. So I'll pass back to Jane. And uh, as we agree, Jane, would now be the time for questions? And you might sure. have a few comments or questions, and then others as well. Or oh, I start looking at chat as well. In fact, okay. well, you, say, you want to say a few words, Jane, and I'll be looking at chat. Okay. We, that, uh, uh, we just we have a great audience here tonight from all over, from Satellite Beach, Florida, from Trim, from Quilty from Castle Troy, uh, Betty's Town, um, lots of Clare, Dublin. Um, I did see somebody, yes, from Marbella in Spain, um, from Hertfordshire. So uh, that's the, the beauty of, um, or the big advantage of Zoom is that you can be anywhere in the world. So that's, it's great to have all those people. Now, um, I'm gonna ask you now, there's a question here. Uh, Trish Hackett has a question. Is the complete deed on family search? Now, I think you answered that, but you might say something about that well, again. I'm glad to say that you get the full digital copy of the transcript of the memorial. Now, the transcript is a full copy of the memorial. And as I've said, in most cases, I believe, certainly until the 20th century, I haven't checked that in detail, you're looking at the full copy of the deed or so much of the deed that it makes no difference. So the good news is definitely Family Search has the full transcript copies for you to read and download if you wish. Okay, good, okay. Um, the next question is, in the case of Clare and or Galway County, how can one determine if a tenant farmer lived on the land of the deed holder? The answer is, alas, in most cases, you can't. What happened, for example, when they wanted to lease out a big collection of town lands, or not so common because landowners were not keen on selling, once you get in the late 19th century, more sales, they just wrote the name of the town land in most cases without the names of the tenants. So all they wanted when they were doing a transaction was the name and location of the town land. Now it is true that a small number of deeds, I think I've only come across one and I was sitting 
in the Red Shoe Deeds one day when somebody said, Eureka, our words to that effect. And there was a little rental in the deed with the names of the tenants. But I assure you, that's a great rarity. You rarely, if ever, see the names of the small tenants. You only get the name of the principal leaseholder. Um, now, we have a couple of comments with regard to the deed that you showed there between the McNamara's. Um, uh, Liam has the comment that Caitlin McNamara married Dylan Thomas, and that's where you get the name of the Dylan Thomas bar in the Falls Hotel. And mm -hmm. apparently, um, Martin Breen has said that there is a small portion of Doolin House, which was the McNamara home, that still remains. So... Um, we don't seem to have any other questions. If anybody else has other questions they want to ask, just to reiterate, somebody was asking about the registry of deeds that they're all held in Dublin. They're, they're, not, they're not in Salt Lake City. It's the microfilms and the, the oh, digitized. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, they're all well, in the Dublin. Moment, to be fair to the moments, they're obviously very particular about that. They came in, asked for permission, which usually was given. You know, for example, when you look at the 1911 census returns, many people are aware that you're looking at digitized copies of Mormon microfilms. Mm. So they only took away copies. They're actually archivally very particular. So in the Granite Mountain in Salt Lake City, you have the microfilms and the original deeds are still at the top of Henrietta Street. I have to say again, it worries me that there isn't a full modern digitization of both the transcripts and the memorials, but the originals are in place, thank goodness. Okay, great, okay. Um, now somebody asked if we could give your contact information again, um, your, um, uh, I assume probably your email information there right. again. And somebody else has asked, are there any original records held at Q? Relating to the registry of deeds? Yeah, I would assume that's what they mean. No. Remember, Ireland had a, a large degree of self-government um, uh, under the British Crown. So there were something, I think, like the Postal Service, where you will find uh, interesting records related to Ireland in queue in the National Archives. But the Registry of Deeds was a purely Irish uh, institution. So they did not keep or take copies of deeds, except probably in rare cases where there was a administrative or legal uh, need for this. So you'll not find. But again, when we talk about the rest of your deeds, you're talking about an exception in Ireland. This is a repository, which is 99.9% .9 intact. It was never destroyed or blown up or anything. So uh, in my experience, looking for copies in Q is just not necessary. We do it for so many other records, mm. just not necessary here. Okay. And Sean, if I put in your um, if I put in your email address there, it's Sean J Murphy, nineteen fifty one. Is it aircom.net? It's no, that's that's not right, isn't it? S J B Murphy. S J B, sorry, Murphy. Murphy one nine five one. Okay. Ash um, gmail.com. I'll okay. give it to you again. S J B Murphy one nine five one at gmail.com. Perfect, okay. And can I share that with everyone? Do indeed, and I'll Perfect. be glad okay. to answer. Put that uh, in the cool. chat there, okay. Um, does anybody have um, any, uh, any other questions there? Um, and somebody is delighted they've just gone into family search now and it works just the way you said it was going to, so that's great. Um, so, and then somebody is just asking about what period were the Mormons copying records? Well, I think that's ongoing, isn't it? The um, copying. Now, can, can I say, I'm not totally a fay, but I detected a slowdown. Oh, and with really? the genealogy boom, unfortunately, I put, put my words as kindly okay. as possible. With the genealogy boom starting in the 1980s, there was active opposition to, quote, stealing of our records by outside bodies. Now, I think most of us know that when they take copies, they then share them to the world, including the Irish. That's, that's their, their, their ethos. Okay. Well, alas, I think it slowed down considerably. Okay. Yeah, I wondered that myself now. Now, somebody has just asked, can you just tell us very quickly about the course that you ran um, through the National Library that was on Zoom? Um, just people are inquiring about it. 
Okay. Uh, so your main source of information is going to be the National Library website. So just, was it NLI.ie, I think. So in any case, Google National Library of Ireland, and you click on the educational link, that will uh, do it from time to time. That will tell you what courses are on. As well, of course, it's my genealogical courses, there are historical courses and livery courses. They're a bit slowed down now, but um, my course, I'm glad to say, has continued. So just um, from time to time, visit the National Library site, click on the educational link, and um, it'll alert you to what's happening. Um, I should say, um, sorry, there, there are other online sites uh, which will keep you up to date what's happening. And of course, I tend to make an announcement myself on my own site when the course is, is coming up. And I know Claire um, Santry. Course, Claire Santry actually oh, right, announced that course. Yeah. Claire Bradley's uh, site, Claire Santry's site, Claire Santry's site. My goodness. Uh, we tend to find everything that's happening in the world of Irish genealogy on Clare Santry site. So it's a good idea to keep tuned into that for anything and everything that's happening in Irish genealogy, including my courses. So the position was that um, when my courses ended in, in UCD, when I reached the dread age of 65, I didn't feel like thrown in the tail just yet. So the National Library, I'm glad to say, gave me an opportunity to continue uh, giving courses. So what we have is an introductory course uh, which gives the basic records which relate to most of our uh, ancestors, the tenant farmers, the laborers, and then an advanced course which moves on to wills, deeds, memorial inscriptions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I have to advise the students that you're going to have to adopt the family to make that relevant because before the 20th century, our, our ancestors rarely put up a tombstone. We're not in the registry of deeds. Rarely left a will. You know. Um, now we're thinking about a possible course again, you know, uh, if there's enough takers, uh, and the National Library agrees, of course, we might move from introductory to advanced to, I don't know, something like topics in Irish genealogy, uh, how to write up genealogy, I'm thinking about that, I mean, I've done a lot of that myself, how to write up your own family history, how to write up the history of a, a, a wealthy family you're interested in, a landlord family, or I don't know, so that's our ideas at present, but it all depends on what the National Library decides. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good anyway. So it's a matter of keeping on to the National Library website to keep an eye on that. Certainly, if we hear mm -hmm. anything, we'll put it up on our Facebook page or our Twitter page or Twitter account. And um, if those of you, I'm sure a lot of people do um, check in with Claire Santry's The Irish Genealogy News blog. Um, and she is very up to date and is really the, the person now that it usually hears of everything first. She's great to keep up with um, genealogy news anywhere in the world. Um, now, just if there's no more questions, and I don't think there is, I just want to thank you very much again, Sean. Uh, very, very interesting lecture. A lot of people have um, just said to us how they were fascinated by it. They weren't aware of the family search. Um, angle there for the um, for the registry of deeds and it's it's really uh, excellent so very very interesting and very informative um, McNamara's from Ottawa I think appreciated having the the deed um, as shown there as an example so uh, many many thanks to you uh, really appreciate it and uh, yeah lots of thanks there from people and this this has been recorded for anybody that may be interested in viewing it again at a later date it is on our Claire Roots media or it will be I should say on our Claire Roots Media YouTube channel um, give it a week or so before it's up um, but we were delighted to have you Sean and we really appreciate your your coming on Zoom for us this evening many thanks for that now this uh, I just wanted to uh, just reiterate again that this is our last meeting for the season until September we did normally take a break in the summer. We will um, be starting again on the 16th of September. I can't tell you whether we are going to be starting um, Zoom only or a hybrid of Zoom and back to the old ground. We will keep you informed about that as the summer progresses and the lockdown eases. Hopefully we will be, um, we will be able to go back to the way we were meeting beforehand. Um, Aileen Wynn, who is a past pupil of Sean's, is going to be our September speaker, and she's going to speak on the Irish Genealogy Projects website and the, the number of 
um, hidden gems in that in that website that you can um, you can access, and that's a very interesting lecture. I've heard her speak about that. It's it's very very um, very good, well worth um, well worth hearing because the Irish Genealogy Project's website covers um, all the different counties all over Ireland. So um, very very good. So that will be on the sixteenth of September, um, in four months' time. Uh, we do have one thing coming up on the 20th of June, provided that COVID um, allows us to do so. Uh, we are going to be commemorating the 100th um, anniversary of the very um, unfortunate tragedy of Patty Morrissey. Patty Morrissey was a six-year-old boy who was very tragically killed by crossfire um, in Ennis, uh, in 1920, while he was playing marbles um, on the street in Ennis. And there is a commemorative plaque that is going to be installed in the old Ennis Community Center on the wall there. And there will be a mass on the day to commemorate, um, to commemorate his um, very short life. Um, now that is subject to COVID restrictions being lifted. We will be um, letting you know about that via email, via Facebook and Twitter, and certainly the local papers and probably Claire FM as well. But that is coming up and the tentative date for that is the 20th of June. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking part in the Zoom lectures this year. We started this back in October and we weren't really sure if it was going to work or not but we have gotten wonderful feedback from our international members and it has been great to see them able to engage with us as most of them can only engage with us during meetings if they're actually in County Clare, but they've been able to do that this year from their own homes. And that's really fantastic. Uh, it is something we are really going to be looking at very seriously about trying to continue um, so that everybody who is a member of Clare Roots can engage with us. And um, Trish, you're welcome is just about the Zoom lectures. I've gotten fantastic feedback and I know other committee members have as well. And I really appreciate uh, your patience with us as we got started and some of the, um, the teething problems as we went from, from one month to another, but we got there and we're pretty good. Um, I think we're pretty good now at Zoom, uh, more or less anyway. So I wanna wish everybody a very happy and healthy and safe summer. I hope you're all vaccinated by the time we see you again in September. Um, I hope I'll be vaccinated as well and I'll be able to meet people in person and um, we look forward to seeing, uh, to seeing you all in um, hopefully in the old ground, if not here on Zoom again and um, stay safe and stay well. And again, thank you very much, Sean, for this evening. So good night, everybody. Um.